You're listening to Hainai by Motsi Dapul. Episode 34.3 Kaibigan This guy really lives up for his title as journalist. Lots of <laughs> journaling. Would have killed it on medium, this guy. I got curious, so I dove back into his other notes to see if I missed anything. I was watching out for mentions of Bolden. I found this entry of his, detailing his friendship with this elder with the books that he keeps mentioning. Here it is. I wish I could believe in Bolden's vision. I truly do. I wish I could be as happy as he. That he does not kill to gain power. He seems so terribly proud of that. But I don't. Believe him. For why would I trust a rich man? Ever so proud of his achievement as though it is not still profiting off of death. He truly doesn't see it. He sees their deaths as nothing more than stories, entertainment, death that he may not have had a hand in, but that he can pick apart like a vulture, profit from and bandy about, treats the people like characters, human beings with lives and loved ones, nothing more than paper dolls. I suppose it shows my biases. Vultures, I'm sure, are an important part of an ecosystem. Part of the natural order. But elders are not that. For all that Bolden claims ethics, he remains alive and well, thanks to Savard's little trick with the first foci and the deaths they still harvest through this day. He's not a good person, Bolden. But then, neither am I. I can't claim to be better than Bolden, who looks at me with such a dreamer's eyes, wishing to minimize the harm of his fellows. He's never spoken to the victims, the survivors like E. He doesn't know what everything he has, and everything he is, is built on. He asked me to call him Cliff, because we're friends. (laughs) Well, he thinks we're friends. He thinks he can trust me. He doesn't know what I know. And he's a useful enough friend to have. So I read his books. I write them down. Free of the constraints of the... leather that they're bound in. I hope that he remains a scavenger. For even as he profits off death, he does not peddle it. And as far as elders go, he remains absolvable. I hope. So I smile, and call him Cliff, and hope that he stays as he is. Nothing worse, but nothing better. I've spoken to a few of Chris Parker's friends, and I don't get the impression that he had a difficult home life. At least, from them. Unfortunately, there is nobody that can corroborate or contradict this observation, as asking his parents would only do the former. Regardless, Chris Parker did not, at least outwardly, seem to have a troubled home life. Perhaps there was something nobody in his life was privy to, or willing to disclose. A 
according to Bolden, who saw his end in Technicolor, Chris Parker seemed to think the world owed him. That he believed he deserved more than he had, though he already lived a fairly privileged life, and was successful in nearly every aspect of that life. This is why, when his parents cut him off from a hefty allowance, and made sure only to provide him with his needs and not his wants, he was deeply embittered. He didn't think much of anything about Brenna. He didn't think much of anyone, but Brenna certainly caught his eye when she began to exist, in a sense. When she got new threads, started changing outfits, started expressing herself more freely. He correctly guessed that she'd come into some money, and at one point cornered her at school, asking, quite reasonably in his mind, where she was getting her payday. A job, she said. When he asked what kind of job, he made it clear that he wanted her to get him in on it. And if she couldn't make it happen, it wouldn't be good for her. And she was agreeable enough, telling him about the cushy gig she'd landed, the kind that he probably could have gotten through his parents' many friends. But those friends wouldn't hesitate to snitch on him to his parents, just as they didn't hesitate when he and his friends had a bit of a hangout, chilled out, and got a little burned out. Not quite the golden boy his parents wanted him to be. I guess they took his money away so he'd stop buying drugs, but boys like that, they find ways. Especially if you know a space cadet who's too out of his damn mind to think twice about selling to some goddamn kids. So he went through Brenna. Strong-armed his way into a job, an easy one. Or so he thought. He was more than ready to invite the whole crew over, but he wanted to scope the place out first pick up some easy green. When he dialed the owner up, one of those real estate types, name of Mr. Reelman, he got welcomed right over since the man trusted Brenna's judgment. They met in front of the house he was meant to be watching, which was one of only four, in a lonely subdivision, half a mile out from their neighbors. Reelman had the kind of smile Chris hated, a plastered-on mask from a man who might as well have no soul. A businessman, through and through. What Chris didn't realize was that he was signing up to do a chore list, as long as his arm, and he tried not to show his annoyance as Reelman went over every entry in excruciating detail. It got stranger and stranger as he went, though Chris knew to bite his tongue so the man wouldn't forget to pay him by the end of the night telling him to talk to an empty room, check the locks twice, even if there was no reason to check them more than once. Chris's parents were well-off and well-respected, so he'd encountered people much richer than them, often enough to know that real rich people were what his father called eccentric. A nice, proper way to refer to people who were out of their goddamn minds. So Realman was one of those eccentrics. As long as Chris could get some bread at the end of the night, he'd do and say whatever, just to keep the man happy. But since the man wasn't sticking around, there was no reason to say anything at all. Half the things real men had on his list couldn't even be verified, no matter how sure he seemed when he looked Chris in the eye and told him he'd know if Chris scrimped on the service. He'd be back by eleven, he said. Just enough time to have a little fun. When he was sure Reelman was gone, car pulled out of the driveway, Chris tried to get his buddies and his girlfriend on the phone. But every time he tried, the call didn't go through. It wasn't too strange, though. The houses in this area were obviously pretty new, so maybe they were still trying to get the lines working right. It was a bit of a bummer, but as long as he didn't get caught, Chris could get another job, get his crew to come over as soon as Mr. Reelman drove off. The last thing Chris did before settling down 
was check if the doors were locked. He'd up the food Reelman left for him. Good stuff, even if Chris would have rather gotten some pizza delivered, if the phone lines weren't so bad out here. And look out the window to see what was going on in neighboring houses. The ones across the road were dark and empty. A bit unsettling in their emptiness, especially with a lack of lighting past the two streetlights on either side of the road for these four houses alone. The single house beside the one he was in, on the other hand, seemed to have a little bit more life. The lights were on, for one, and Chris saw movement in the upper floors, with curtains getting closed one by one, but the porch light, a beacon in the dark. Even if he wasn't a coward, it was nice to know he wasn't alone. It was tough to be alone. Chris was present enough to look the list over, see what he could be caught out for. He planned to bring it back with him, show the crew the absolute bonkers request from this rich weirdo. Some of the instructions were absolutely idiotic, but he made sure to check the rooms he was told to check, in case the old man was trying to trick him. Maybe there were some instructions in the rooms, some kind of evidence real men could use against him. Chris wasn't stupid, after all. Intelligence wasn't the main factor in this job. Obedience was. Perhaps even humility. Chris Parker was, and had, neither of these. When he entered the bedroom, he felt a little sick, like vertigo. He opened the windows to air it out, and the draft that came in whistled in a way that sounded like a distant wail. He had to laugh at himself for jumping. He ended up checking under the bed, checking the closet for anything unusual. The one thing of interest was what he found when he rifled through the bedside drawer. A handgun. Small and old, but it was heavy enough to be real. And though Chris had not handled one before... The bullets in the same drawer implied it was either loaded, or that he could load it then and there. He would have taken it, if he thought real men wouldn't notice. He'd remember it, however, in case he needed it later. He went to check the basement, with its unfortunate, creaking door. Strange, when the house seemed mostly new. But when the light didn't work to illuminate the bottom of the steep steps, he simply locked the door up on top, refusing to give it any more consideration. It was tiring to realize how much on the list he couldn't fake, but he got through checking every room he needed to, and gave up on the rest Reelman had no way of knowing about. He relaxed on the couch in the living room, eating his food in front of the boob tube, enjoying a raunchy horror film about some teens facing down a mass killer. The kind with pretty girls Chris liked, and handsome boys Chris was like. The kind where he hoped they'd win the day, but he still found it entertaining when the killer eventually caught them, even when it made no sense. It was well into the evening before he knew it. Out of curiosity, once more, he checked the window. The porch light still shone, the curtains were all shut, but through them he could see the shadow. Boy or girl, he couldn't tell, but young, as close as he could guess. Maybe watching the house, like he was. What if it was Brenna? What if she gave him the shit job with a weirdo with his weird instructions, keeping the good one to herself? He thought it might be a good idea to check. Stormed out the back door, followed the fence until he came to the porch, knocking on the neighbor's door, expecting to see his classmate when she answered. Instead, the girl who opened the door was taller, with baby blue eyes and freckles across her cheeks. She wore a pretty white shirt, airy for the weather, and blue jeans. She smiled with a delicate mouth, 
asking him if she could help him with anything. And he was so taken aback that he couldn't say anything at all. Oh, you're watching Reelman's Place. I remember when he hired me to do it a few years back. Hmm, <laughs> you know, she said, conspiratorially. One of Mr. Reelman's rules says you shouldn't leave the house for any reason. Tripped me up, too, when I was looking after it. But I won't tell if you won't. She put her index finger up to her mouth, winking at him. It was a pretty gesture, as pretty as everything about this girl. But it was a bit odd when she quietly said, Shh. with a bit of a whistle that reminded him of the wind. She told him to get back, but that they should hang out later, if he was free. He didn't even hesitate to say yes. He'd never seen a girl that pretty in real life, not even his girlfriend. He was on cloud nine when he got back to Reelman's place. Thinking on it, the girl seemed familiar, somehow. But he couldn't quite place her. Once he'd gotten through dinner, he brought out what he'd stashed safe and out of sight in his backpack. Some of his own alcohol until he could figure out a way to break into Reelman's cabinet without being totally obvious. He had a bit of speed and a bit of grass in his pack, too, but it was too easy to spill or smell, and Chris wasn't risking all that. He'd gotten through about a third of the bottle when he heard it. A crash in the direction of the kitchen. Even as relaxed as he'd gotten from the booze, he was on high alert at the sound. And the first thought he had in that moment froze the blood in his veins. Did he lock the kitchen door when he came back in? He couldn't remember. He thought he did, but... Another crash, and he was on his feet. He heard heavy footfalls, and before he even knew what was going on, he was bolting for the bedroom, trying to keep his footfalls as light as possible, uncertain what, whoever it was, could hear. His mind conjured up images of a masked murderer with a giant knife and big, clomping boots, and that was all he could imagine coming to find him. He ran upstairs, locked the door behind him when he got to the bedroom. He tried to get the window open, but it was jammed, somehow, and he knocked on it in frustration. His eye caught a lit-up window from the neighbors, a silhouette against the light of the living room. He tried to get the girl's attention, hoping against hope that she could help him. He was surprised when he looked up at the bedroom window opposite his own and saw the same girl looking out at him. She wasn't the one in the living room. She was looking right at him now, smiling strangely. She blew him a kiss, and suddenly a memory came flooding back. When he was young and his father took him to a local baseball game. The high school athlete who he aspired to be like. And the girl he sat next to in the bleachers who blew her boyfriend a kiss. Whose face showed up in missing posters some months later. Though his father assured him she probably just ran away. Moved to Toronto for a better life. She held a finger up to her mouth and he heard the shh like wind whistling in, though the window would not open. Chris tore his gaze away from the window when he heard the slow, loud clomping of boots coming up the stairs. When he looked back, the girl wasn't there anymore. But in the darkened bedroom, he saw something swinging, steadily, dressed in white with blue jeans. He had no time to think of it when something heavy began to slam against the bedroom door. He dove under the bed, just in time, as the lock gave and the door swung open. He saw dark work boots, stained with reddish-brown that could have been soil or dried blood, just like in the movie. The intruder made his way around the room, and Chris could hardly breathe, heart in his throat when the hulking giant of a man, for it could hardly be anything else, walked close to the bed. He only remembered the gun when the intruder checked the closet. 
The gun in the drawer. 50-50 on whether it was loaded. But he had to try. He waited and waited and waited for the man to finally tire of the room and move on. And finally... Chris took the gun from out of the drawer. He never used one, but he knew he had to click something... the safety off? It felt so loud in his ears when he did it. It was apparently loud enough to catch the intruder's attention, because he heard those heavy footfalls coming quickly back, but now he was ready. He wasn't helpless, he was armed. When the enormous figure stepped into the door, wearing a cheap latex mask that looked terrifying in the dark, Chris unloaded the old gun, every shot making his ears ring. The man was dead on the ground by the end of it, unmoving, not a sound, not a breath, blood seeping into the carpet. With all the adrenaline draining out of him, Chris Parker walked over the body and down to the kitchen, where the phone was. Right before he could pick it up, it rang. The police are coming. You have to get out of there now, said the girl on the line. Brenna. It was Brenna. But why was she calling? Was she in the other house? But what about that girl? He only realized when he put the phone down that he hadn't said a word. Just breathed into the receiver. He was more out of it than he thought. Well, if the police were coming, then he had nothing to worry about. He killed the intruder. He was a hero. He sat back down on the couch, energy spent. The TV was still running on low volume, and the hero on screen rammed the mass killer with his car. Chris couldn't help but smile. Then, he heard it. The basement door creaking open. There were some supplementary notes written in the back here. This was not the first time, nor the first unsuspecting youngster, that the elder, who went by Jeffrey Reelman, got to watch his house. Tabitha Langley happened a lot earlier, and they found her hanging in the bedroom, a tragedy so profound that her family left town, and nobody else ever figured out what happened to the girl who had dreams of making a life in Toronto. When I asked Bolden about this elder, hoping to pay him a visit, he said that he was already dead, and that the one who killed him was the benefactor. I know. It must seem confusing. You've encountered enough elders to know how many of us are dangerous, but... I do my best not to hurt anyone when I do what I do. All my power I take from the memories of the dead. The more dead whose stories I record, the more power I gather. If I'm lucky, I can get perhaps two or three people who die in the same miasma, the same story. It is a rare thing for a focus to absorb more than that. Do you remember the book I lent you? About Sylvia Lewin? Now, that was a rare case indeed. So many fear deaths absorbed by a single focus. I'm sure Lowell would be proud that he bagged five people in the same miasma if he weren't quite dead. 
head eaten off by a wahila of the mountains, wouldn't you know? Oh, benefactor. He found his focus in a strange state. It seemed alive, strangely. The way a plant or rudimentary organism is alive. He was kind enough to let me draw Sylvia's story out of it, which is how I was able to record it in one of my books. I'd spent a pretty penny gilding the... leather. (laughs) The focus pulsed with life, like feeling a heart beat, and the power it could put into a single book unmatched. And yet, still not quite as much power as you'd expect. I've had to fill a library with the memories I wrote down from the foci I've been lent. A long, painstaking process, but one I wouldn't change for anything. To draw power where we thought none left. But can you imagine? A single focus absorbing the deaths of Dozens, even hundreds. <laughs> the power I could draw from a single witness of such a terrible fate. But mass death events like that, it's rare. Especially here. There has only been one instance where such death was captured in a single vessel. Though, if my suspicions are correct, perhaps two. Our leader Savard. He believed in fairness, but even he peddled death in his own way. On his orders, we gathered all our cursed foci, and he scattered them across Ontario, and perhaps even beyond, to activate when they touched weaknesses in the veil that separates this life from the next. Haunted places, or even places where terrible things happened, and the emotions and memory tied to those places would latch on to the power of a focus. Think of them as the ignition, and the focus the fuel, and whatever nightmare they experience to extract the power of their fear death, the combustion. They kill indiscriminately these foci in the way that death is indiscriminate, feeding each of us power and life. But, my fellows, they've been gaming the system, as it were. You might have noticed from the stories I lent you from my library that the most recent ones happened this decade. The one with the teenager, you remember? Parker. That was from an elder called Robert Elman, who had been working in real estate under the name Jeffrey Realman. <laughs> Past tense. He's quite dead now. The benefactor got to him. Oh, yes. I don't know how much you've heard, but our benefactor is quite the figure among the elders who remain. No, I I don't know who he is. I've met him, and remember encountering him at Savard's meetings long ago, but every time I try to remember his face, or his voice, or anything about him, really, it slides off my mind like water. A spell most powerful. One only he could cast, because he is the benefactor. His power is unprecedented among us elders. Uh, I admire him for what he does, but he's an enigma, and that makes most of us uneasy, despite our alliances. What I do know of him is how he's gone after other elders. How he's killed a few. I never took part in these petty conflicts. My ambitions lay solely in my own work. 
I have had to defend myself, however. I was finally able to breathe easy, because, among elders, it was well known that he was the most powerful. We had all heard of the puppet master, this upstart, not quite an elder, yet as powerful, or more powerful than, well, all of us. Because they did not abide by our rules and our limitations, the ones Savard had established at the beginning of the century, we feared that puppet master so. Though, just like that, the benefactor had come along and defeated them. Meanwhile, growing all the more powerful. I don't know the details. I wasn't there at Hyde. All I know of the incident, I learned from the Bartholathi. You covered that, didn't you? In your paper? Hmm. I'll have to pick your brain at some point. I can't imagine how you found so much information. <laughs> A survivor. I didn't even know. I thought the only survivors were those who weren't there that night. Huh. <laughs> Fascinating. <clears throat> anyway, where was I? Uh, oh, yes. I know that the benefactor came upon some power when he fought the puppet master, such that he became even more dangerous than he already was and we knew him to be exceptionally dangerous. We fear him, but he's not unreasonable. He is a code of ethics. There's a reason we call him Benefactor, and it was not a title he gave himself. He's quite benevolent, <laughs> in his own way. <laughs> I know, it's strange to say. When I've spoken of how dangerous he is, but it is true. The elders he's killed, well, despite Savard's best efforts, the ideal of randomness as the great equalizer, well, it didn't figure on certain elders making more, more foci in secret to give them an edge over their fellows. The original batch of foci Savard disseminated are such that the power gained from them come to each of us equally, but these new foci belonged only to those who created them. Other elders began to hoard resources, gather power, and, well, kill people. Those are the elders the benefactor has killed with impunity, and an unrivaled bloodthirst that, in my ears, I have never seen. Hmm. Despite this, he is quite an agreeable fellow. He's always been kind the few times I've spoken to him directly, but what he did to his enemies, well, that's not a man you want to cross, I'll say that. He may not be omniscient, but... There's an argument to be made about the other thing. <laughs> Omnipotent. Anyway, I have a healthy amount of fear for our benefactor, but I do not fear becoming his victim, because I do not target the living, only the dead. Oh, and even if I did... He isn't omniscient. I found this note. It's the only thing written on this page. I don't know what it means, but, well... It says... He took Elaine. You're listening to... Hainai by Motsi Dapul
Hello, everyone. It's Monsi. As of writing, the U.S. is the only country to veto a ceasefire, represented by U.S. Ambassador Robert Wood. For this reason, the U.S. government under Joseph Biden is not only complicit, but directly responsible for the ongoing genocide by Israel in Gaza of over 20,000 people. Doctors Without Borders has called it a vote against humanity after many of their colleagues have been murdered by Israel. I know many Haine listeners are from the USA. Don't feel hopeless. You have more power than you realize. Keep calling or emailing and pressuring your reps. Make it clear that you demand a ceasefire and that you will not vote for someone who has actively committed to the genocide of over 20,000 people. Support or join protests. If you are able to lend your voice to a local movement for a ceasefire and or to free Palestine, please do. We can donate all you want, but people in Gaza will not have access to the donations until a ceasefire and end to the genocide is called. We've attached ways you can get in contact with your reps, as well as movements to get Gaza connected to the internet, and keep in contact with our loved ones. We've attached info from Mirna El Helbawi on eSIMS for Gaza. Please read the instructions very carefully. Go to gazaesims.com, that's G-A-Z-A-E-S-I-M-S dot com, or follow at Mirna underscore El Helbawi, that's M-I-R-N-A underscore E-L-H-E-L-B-A-W-I, on socials for more updates. Keep going. Keep fighting. We have no choice. We love you. Be safe. Everyone. And may we all see a free Palestine very soon. Hey everyone, this is Reg Heli, co-creator and co-producer of Hainai. Hainai is a podcast produced by Mati Dapo, Yoi Halago, Alisa Jimenez, and me, and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution non-commercial share-alike 4.0 international license. This episode was co-produced by Jesse Goodsell and written and directed by Mati Dapo, who plays the role of Mary Datuin. The role of Clifford Bolden was played by Kalel Tyler. If you'd like to chat with other listeners when this episode goes live, we do a live premiere every other Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or Toronto Time on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash hainaipod. To help support the production of Hainai, you can subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash hainaipod. You'll get to be a part of our early access program where we release episodes three days earlier on Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or Toronto Time. You can also get bonus video, audio, art, and so much more. Speaking of Patreon, we'd love to give a shout out to the following patrons for all their amazing support. Victoria Goodwin, Pablo Neurotic, Megan, Malaya Light, Evie Smith, Danny, Astra Kim, and Jesse Goodsell. We appreciate your support so much, and we would not be here without you. If you can't subscribe monthly, you can also have the option to buy us a milk tea and coffee at coffee.com slash hainaipod. That's ko-fi.com slash hainaipod. Our ad-free Hainai album, which has our official music and full episodes from Act 1 and 2, is also available in both Patreon and the coffee store. Check out our website, hainaipod.com, for more news and updates, and don't forget to follow us on our Tumblr, hainaipod.tumblr.com, as well as our socials, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at hainaipod. Hainai is available on Acast, along with Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Hainai will be taking a short break for the holidays. We'll still be posting a bonus feature or two, but we will be back with brand new mainline episodes on February 4. 2024. As always, thank you, we love you, and hanggang sa muli.